you have your Bibles, Matthew 5 is where we are at. We are in the middle of a series called Rebels, um, looking at the Sermon on the Mount and what it means for us to be a follower of Jesus, what it means for us to uh, live this life called the Christian life, what it means for us to be disciples of Jesus. And we've been looking at statements that Jesus have been, has been making, statements that contradict everything we believe, everything we think, and he contrasts that with what a disciple should like. Like, and these are hard statements. It's easy for us to obey the letter of the law while completely ignoring the intent of the law. And Jesus has been hitting at that hard over the last five weeks that we've been studying together. It's very easy for us to say, I'm not going to murder anyone. And Jesus says, that's good. That's great. It's great, great that you don't murder. But what about your anger issue? Because it's not just about murder. It's also about your heart and how you respond to people, how you relate to people. So your heart and your anger is the issue that I want to deal with, not just the fact that you don't murder. And he says, it's, it's great that you don't commit adultery. It's great that you don't sleep with another man's wife or another woman's husband. But what about the fact that you lust after them? What about in your heart that you are do, imagining things or thinking things that are inappropriate? That's what I care about. I don't care that you don't simply keep the rule or the letter of the law, but I care about your heart. I care about how you live. It's great that you're not going to divorce your spouse. It's great that you'll live there with your spouse for the rest of your life, but, but do you love her like Christ loved the church? Do you honor him and submit to him as unto Jesus? It's not just about keeping the law. There's a deeper issue here. And last week we looked at retaliation and um, how it's not just about um, not attacking back. It's also about responding back in kindness. And we're going to continue the same theme this morning. And Jesus makes some statements that are incredibly hard for us to digest. And he makes a statement in verse 48 that's impossible for us to do. And so Matthew 5, 43 to 48 says, You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you will love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the pagans do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Before Germany, East Germany and West Germany were reunited, the predominant university in East Germany was the University of East Berlin. There's a man by the name of Hugh Homer who had eight children, and all eight of his children applied to attend the University of East Berlin. Every single one of them was rejected. The East German Ministry of Education wasn't in the habit of giving reasons for why students were rejected. They, they could simply reject you for any reason. But in this case, the reason was obvious. Hugh Homer was one of the few pastors in East Germany. And the chancellor at the school was the wife of the East Germany East German, was a wife of the East German premier, the chancellor, the, the leader of the country. He was the man that built the Berlin Wall in 1961. And she rejected all of this pastor's kids simply because of the fact that he was a pastor. And then in 1989, the walls of Germany fell, the Berlin Wall fell, and Conacher, who was the chancellor, and his wife were unceremoniously dismissed from office. They were indicted for several, several criminal activities during his tenure as the leader of Germany. They were evicted from their palace. They had no place to go. The people that used to be in community with them have rejected them. They had no resources. They had no friends. They were completely abandoned. None of their former camaraderies showed them any humanitarianism that they, were, um, that they boasted about as a communist government. No one wanted to identify with this family, except Pastor Homer. Despite the unfair treatment that his family received because of their faith, the pastor extended an invitation for the homemakers, Hanukkahs, to stay with his family in their parsonage. 
having nowhere else to go, they finally accepted the invitation because before they eventually moved to Chile. And though they were outspoken atheists, Pastor Homer reported that the former premier and his wife would often fold their hands and close their eyes when they'd have family prayer. You know, I read that story, I hear that story, and it's, for me, that's not a natural course of action. That's not how I would respond to someone that hurts me. That's not how I would respond to someone that doesn't just hurt me, but also hurts the future of my children. I would rather, humanly speaking, let them suffer on the streets. Let them get what they deserve. But to invite enemies into your home, to let them stay in your bed, to let them partake of a meal at your table, to show them love and compassion, that's a pretty radical thing to do. And in our text this morning, Jesus says some pretty radical stuff about that. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany that would protect the Jews, and he was harassed and imprisoned and eventually executed by the Nazi regime. And until the day he was hanged, he prayed daily for Hitler and his salvation. He wrote in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he said, the will of God is that men should defeat their enemies by loving them. Abraham Lincoln was quoted as saying, I defeat my enemies by making them my friends. See, most of us will do good at loving our neighbors, and we do really good at hating our enemies. But there's a logical flaw in that philosophy, if you think about it. G.K. Chesterton reveals it to us in a statement that drives home Jesus' point in this passage. He says, you can't love your neighbor and hate your enemy because they're often one and the same. Often they're the exact same person. You ever notice our friends will come and go. You have friends for a season, and then they're gone, and then you get new friends, and then they're gone, and then you get new friends. Have you ever noticed your list of enemies? They never disappear, do they? They just get, get bigger and bigger and bigger. Your enemies are there all the time. They accumulate, and often our closest neighbors are sometimes become our enemies. Often they're our loved ones. Look at Jesus' life, and there's a man by the name of Judas who hung out with Jesus for three and a half years, and all of a sudden he turns out to be the one that betrays Jesus. Brutus was the lifelong friend and confidant of Julius Caesar, but he betrays him. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, Beware of no man more than yourself. We carry the worst enemy within us. We make our friends and we make our enemies, but God is the one who makes our neighbors. So how can you love your neighbor and hate your enemies if they're one and the same. Jesus says that we have to see our enemies as our neighbors. You only have to think about the life of Nelson Mandela, the, um, the man who transformed South Africa, um, to see a modern-day example of what Jesus was talking about. He forgave those who imprisoned him, and then he led black South Africans to forgive generations of white racism in that country. And after he won the Nobel Peace Prize, Mandela said, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy. And then your enemy is no longer your enemy. He's now your partner. See, this is the power of loving your enemies the way that Jesus talks about. Now, let's be honest. That's a difficult thing to do. And what Jesus does in our text this morning is he gives us several statements to help us live this lifestyle. So let's look at these. Number one, everyone is a friend or, and an enemy. Everyone is a friend and an enemy. Or if you have kids and watch the Disney Channel, they're frenemies, right? Um, um, that's what they are. They're friends one day or enemies one day. He begins in verse 43. He says, you've heard it said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And he makes this statement. He is reminding the people of the Jewish rabbinical, of the people, the Jewish rabbinical interpretations of Moses' words in Leviticus 19 where Moses writes that you shouldn't seek a revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your own people, but you should love your neighbor as yourself. Don't seek revenge or hold a grudge against your own people, but love your neighbor as yourself. But you got to notice the key phrase in that statement. It's that phrase, your people. Don't hold a grudge against your people. Don't 
um, hate your people. Don't be angered at your people. You've got to ask the question, who are your people? For them, it was the Jews that were just like them. For us, it's your family, it's your tribe, it's your sect, it's your synagogue, it's your denomination, whatever it may be. Being a neighbor isn't necessarily who lives next to you. It's defined as your people, the people that look like you, think like you, act like you, pray like you, believe like you, vote like you. You don't hate, you don't hold a grudge, you don't seek revenge against your people. You love them the way that you would love yourself, and that's not hard. Because they're just like you anyway, but the others, those that don't belong to your tribe, those that don't belong to your club, those that don't belong to your church, those that don't buy into the same political views that you believe, they're your enemies. The same rules don't apply to them. They're outside of your people. Ironically, you won't find a single sentence or phrase in all of the rabbinical teachings that tells you how to love your enemy. So when Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, you've heard it said, um, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, in just a few words, he overthrows 1,400 years of rabbinical teaching. And 2,000 years later, his words are still overturning our prejudices, our racism, our assumptions. See, he grasped the illogical thinking of loving your neighbors and hating your enemies. He knew that enemies and neighbors were often one and the same. In the book of Acts, Paul is about to be prayed over and sent as a missionary from the city of Ephesus, a church that he planted. And before he leaves, he warns the church. He says the following words. He says, I know that after I leave, there will be fierce wolves that will come in among you. From among your own selves, there will be men that will speak twisted things to draw you away from Christ. He's saying, even elders of your own church will turn into wolves. Do you catch that? Your people, your elders, the ones that are, you are called to love like yourself can turn on you and destroy you, your lives, and the church. The one that sits with you at the same table in the same church, studying the same Bible with the same theological perspective, having partaken in the same baptism, communion, and faith. They are your neighbors, but they can also become your enemies. Paul says your elder neighbor can become a savage wolf or an enemy that will try to destroy you. But on the other hand, Jesus also says that your enemy can also become your neighbor. There was a day where a religious leader came to Jesus and said, asked him a question, a simple question. He said, who is your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus doesn't like to give him a straightforward answer. He tells him a story. And he begins the story of talking about a Jewish man who was on his way down the Jericho Road. And he was, we don't know why he was on the road. He's just journeying. And along the way, he gets mugged and he's left half beaten to death. And he's laying there, a priest passed by, a Levite passed by. They see the man lying there. Catch this, he is one of their people. This is your people, a neighbor for sure. But they don't treat him the same way that they would want to be treated. In fact, they ignore him. They leave him to die. The man's neighbors become his enemies just as much as the robbers who robbed him and left him for half dead. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He continues the story. He says, and the story gets incredibly juicy at this point for this religious leader. He says, all of a sudden, a Samaritan walks by. This is a guy who is not your people. This is your enemy. These are people that you have been sparring with and fighting with and arguing with for over 500 years. There's a, their theology is messed up. They're a mixed people. They're half Jews and half Gentiles. They're completely out. They're out. They're the enemies. But the Samaritan doesn't do what the priest and the Levite does. He actually takes his shirt off of his back. He goes the extra mile to bind up the man's wounds and then assists him to get to a safe place. And Jesus stops and asks the religious leader, he says, which of these three men were the neighbor, was the neighbor to the victim that fell to the robbers? And the scholar answers this, and he says, the one that had mercy on him. See, our neighbors can often be our enemies, and sometimes our enemies can be our neighbors. Most people are frenemies. 
the Urban Dictionary for the word frenemy, it's actually a word, um, is, defines it as a friend who is also an enemy. Let's be honest, if you're married, sometimes most husbands and wives are frenemies. One moment, we are really, really good to our spouse and loving on them and caring for them and incredibly sweet. The next moment, we are mean and nasty and rude. Friends a second, enemies the next second. Elders can be savages in an instant. Even religious leaders on their way home from church can leave a fellow brother to die in the middle of a road. In the upper room, Jesus calls his disciples and he looks at them and he calls them, you're my friends. And within hours, one of his friends, Judas, turns his back on him and betrays him. Peter rejects him and the other disciples all flee the scene. These friends became enemies in an instant, frenemies. Frenemies bail when the going gets tough. Those closest to us will often hurt us the most. We will love them and they will be our kind of people, but then often when things get hard and difficult, they will be the ones that we can't find at all. So the first thing we have to understand that if we're truly going to love like Jesus commands us to love is we've got to realize that all people will be our frenemies. Some days they'll be good to us and sometimes they'll be mean to us and sometimes we'll be good to them and sometimes we'll be mean to them. It is all people will face that. Secondly, he says, love is an action, not a feeling. Verse 44, he says, I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Three key words in this verse I want you to pay attention to. The first word, enemy there, it literally means one who is hostile to you. The word persecute there means one who pursues you and harasses you. Put these two words together, it speaks of someone who is coming after you with the intent of hurting you or harming you. How do you respond? The Jewish interpretation of the law says you don't have to treat them nicely. You can be mean to them. You can be rude to them. They're your enemies. They are not your people. You don't have to treat them the same way you treat your neighbor or you treat your friends. You can actually turn back and reject them. You can be cruel to them. But then all of a sudden, Jesus comes in and says, no, you are to love them. The word that Jesus used for love is the word agape. That's important because Jesus isn't saying that you have to have a warm, fuzzy, gooey feeling toward them. If he was talking about that, he would have used the word eros, where we get the word erotic from. He wasn't talking about simply having an affection for them. He would have used the word phileo. But he uses the most supreme word in the Greek for love. He uses the word agape. And that's important because this is a love that is not defined by actions or feelings or affections. This is a love that is defined by how you respond regardless of how you feel. I love when I get nothing in return. It is unconditional. It is sacrificial. What does that love look like? Jesus illustrates it very well to us in John when he speaks to Nicodemus and he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his son. That's sacrificial. Jesus willingly came. That's sacrificial. We are called to pray for those who hurt us. That's sacrificial. See, Jesus is giving us marching orders in this text. When someone does something mean to you, act, do an act of kindness to them. When someone says a mean word to you, go bake a cake for them. Shock them. When a Roman soldier drives nails through your hands and feet, res Jesus responds by saying, God, forgive them. He responds to the plea of a criminal who is moments earlier mocking him. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. When the first martyr of the faith, Stephen, was being stoned to death, he prays for those who were stoning him. He says, Father, forgive them. Don't hold the sin against them. Think about the ramifications of this. Imagine what would happen in our world if when people hurt us, we actually treated them back with kindness. When people said something mean to us and were rude to us or hurt our reputation or hurt our character, instead of attacking back, we actually wouldn't serve them and we cared for them. 
Can you imagine what kind of world that would be? Mahatma Gandhi was the father of the independence movement in India, and he remained a Hindu till the day he died. But he was very familiar with the teachings of Jesus. He once commented that he would have become a Christian if he ever really saw one. But here's what he said when he read the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what he said about Jesus. He said, a man who was completely innocent offered himself as a sacrifice for the good of others, including his enemies, and became the ransom for the world. It was the perfect act of kindness. Jesus reminds us that if we are to love our enemies or love our neighbors, then we need to remember that all people need loving. It's not just people like you. We need to remember that love is an action, not a feeling. And he continues, and he tells us the next thing, and he reminds us the third thing is that we have our Father's DNA. That we have our Father's DNA. Verse 45, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. What's he doing here? He is reminding you that you have a Father in heaven. He looks at us and calls him your father in heaven. This is a personal, possessive pronoun that he uses here. Our father belongs to us, and we belong to him. It's not your God in heaven. This is your father in heaven. You belong to him. He belongs to you. And he goes on and tells them something about his father's character. He says, this father of yours, he drops rain on the just, and he drops rain on the unjust. He lets the sun shine on the wicked, and he lets the sun shine on the, on the righteous. Who are the righteous? Those are his people. Those are people like him. Those are people that do what he wants them to do. They are his people, your people. Who are the unjust? Who are the wicked? They're not his people. They're the outcasts. They're the enemies. They're the ones that rabbinic law would say, you have nothing to do with them. They're the ones that the teachers would say, treat them like you would treat, like scum. Don't be nice to them. And, and Jesus says, your father, who you belong to, he pours rain on you, and he pours rain on those who are not like you at all. He pours rain. He gives rain to those who love him and pursue him. And he gives grace to those who have no right for his grace, have, are a complete mess and a disaster. He, treats, he gives them all the same treatment. Those who rebel against him have the same life-giving, soothing rays of the sun as those who please him as his righteous father, as their righteous kids. He's reminding us of a very important fact of life. You're to do the same. That you have a father in heaven, and if he is your father, you have his DNA. You are supposed to resemble him. You are supposed to imitate him. You are to grow up to be like him. Years ago, there's a lady, I think she still sings, by the name of Amy Grant, um, wrote a song, I think in the 70s, during Roy's time, um, called um, Father's Eyes. And in this song, she talks about this girl and her flaws and her imperfections, imperfections. But there's one thing she said that she wanted her daughter to have. Here's the lyrics to her song. She said, she got her father's eyes, her father's eyes, eyes that find good in things when good is not around, eyes that find the source of help when help can't be found, eyes full of compassion, seeing every pain, knowing what you're going through and feeling just the same, just like my father's eyes. What about you? Do you let the refreshing rain of your righteousness and your love and kindness fall on those who do unrighteous things to you? Do you let the warm sunshine of goodness and mercy and grace fall with grace on those who fail you and disappoint you and hurt you? See, if you say you're the son of God or a daughter of God and that God is your father in heaven, then you're supposed to have his DNA. You're supposed to respond 
the way that he responds. You'll do what he does because you're supposed to be like him. You're to see that all people are frenemies, that all people deserve grace, that all people can hurt you. It's not just people like you. You're supposed to remember that love is an action, not a feeling. If you're a child of God, you're supposed to resemble your father. And number four, you're supposed to remember that your family is extraordinary. Your family is extraordinary. Verse 46, 47. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do that? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the pagans do that? Listen, Jesus is being incredibly uncompromising in this statement. Here's what he's saying. How we treat our enemies prove the reality of our salvation. How we treat people, those who hurt us, prove to the world the reality that we belong to Jesus. If you love those who just love you, it doesn't prove a thing. Even tax collectors, traders who have sold out to the enemy and uh, who are occupying the land and are gangsters who defraud people and take people's money, have what it takes to love those who are just like them. If you greet your own people and you're kind to your own people, it doesn't prove a thing. Even pagan people, people who have abandoned the true God for stone and wood and other material things, know how to embrace their own kind. Loving your neighbors doesn't prove anything at all. He's saying, listen, if you belong to me and if you're part of my family, you're not ordinary. You should not be satisfied with ordinary lives. Growing up, my parents had this high standard of expectation for me and my brother in almost every area of life. I don't know how much of that was cultural and how much of that was just being a pastor's kid and how much of that was just my parents' expectations. Sometimes me and him would complain that everyone else would get to do stuff that we couldn't do or that we were made to do things that no one else had to do. And their response was something along the lines of, you're not everyone else. You're a Chaco. You're a pastor's son. You are not like everybody else. Basically, what they were saying was, you're not ordinary. And so I'm going to say, I'm extraordinary. Right? Um, and see, I think that's what God is saying of us. You're not ordinary. You're not just like everyone else. You have been saved by grace. You have experienced his love. God Almighty, who gave his life for you, now lives inside of you. You're not ordinary. You're extraordinary. You're different. And you should be expected to live at a higher level than a tax collector or a pagan. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who I talked about earlier, challenges us to expect more of ourselves when it comes to engaging those who are not like us. Listen to the words that he writes in his book, Life Together. He says, Jesus Christ lived in the midst of his enemies. At the end, all of his disciples deserted him. On the cross, he was utterly alone, surrounded by evildoers and mockers. For this cause, he had come to bring peace to the enemies of God. So the Christian, too, belongs not in seclusion or a cloistered life, but in the thick of foes. There's his commission. There's his work. The kingdom is to be in the midst of your enemies. And he will not suffer this. And he who will not suffer this does not want to be part of the kingdom of Christ. He wants to be among friends, to sit among roses and lilies, and not with bad people, but devout people. Oh, you blasphemers and betrayers of Christ. If Christ did for you what you are doing, who would have ever been spared? Listen, you are not ordinary. It's not enough simply to be around people like you. You have been saved so that you can love those that don't know Jesus. He didn't save you and immediately zap you into heaven. That would have been easy, and you wouldn't have to worry about it. He saved you, and then he immediately put you back into the environments that you're already at with your same friends, your same family, your same coworkers, your same classmates. He puts you there, and your call is to love 
the way that Christ loves. Because Christ lives in you. You are not ordinary. Number five. Here's where it gets hard. He says our goal is perfection. Our goal is perfection. He ends this chapter with an unbelievable statement. He says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word perfect there means to have purpose or a goal. It speaks of striving for a goal or reaching our ultimate purpose in life. So you've got to ask the question, what is our ultimate purpose in life? What is our goal? What are we created for? What do we live for? Why are we here? The Apostle Paul will write it this way. For those he foreknew, he predestined. Here's why. To be conformed to the image of his son. See, that's the ultimate purpose of why we were saved. That we would think, that we would look, that we would act, that we would behave like Jesus. That we would become like our Savior. And when we finally get to that point, we reach perfection. What does it mean to be like Jesus? It means that when we are slapped, we remain quiet. It means that when we are rejected, we respond back in love. It means that when we are handed a cross, we put it on our shoulders without rebuking the people who condemned us to it. It means when they put a crown of thorns on our head, they, when they beat us with whips, when they drive nails into our hands and our feet, we pray to the Father to forgive them. We love when we're hated. We turn the other cheek when we are slapped. We give the shirt off of our backs. We go the second mile. That is what's it mean, that's what it means to be like Jesus. See, Jesus is calling us to do something that goes against everything in our nature. Perfection is impossible this side of the heaven. So why is he telling us that? Because he wants us to see the poverty of our spirit. He wants to drive us back to the Beatitudes. Benjamin Franklin once wrote, he said, love your enemies for they expose your faults. See, the way that we respond to our enemies and our neighbors shows the bankruptcy of our spirits shows that we are poor in spirit, that we're unable to do that. And that drives us to the second beatitude where we mourn over our shortcomings and say, God, help. We can't do this. We're reduced to meekness. And only when we're reduced to meekness will we begin to hunger and thirst for a righteousness that's not our own. And so at that fourth beatitude, we see we cling to Christ for his presence and his power in our lives. And only then can we be merciful to those who hurt us. Only then can we be pure of heart. Only then can we be peacemakers. See, the live like this will cause us to be persecuted. Not only from the outside, but the enemy within. The junk that's inside of us will rear its ugly head. And we will not always respond right in a right manner to our enemies. And so what do we do? We drive right back to the first beatitude and recognize we're poor in spirits. We mourn over our shortcomings. We plead with God for help. We become absolutely dependent on him to say, God, unless you do this in me, unless you help me, I can never do this. This is not about me trying to do this. This is about you empowering me to do this. It's not about me trying to earn favor with you. It's about you transforming my life so that I can love the way that you love. It's about you filling me with your presence. It's about me dying to myself. It's about me, you removing the things in my life that are not like you so that more of you can be inside of me so that more of you can be seen outside of me. See, this is what it means to love your enemies. This is what it means to be perfect like God is perfect. It means your flesh has to die on a daily basis. Your desires have to die. Your intents have to die. Your prerogatives have to die. Your rights have to die. Your goals have to die. 
your desires have to die. And as that happens, God begins to transform your life. Well, when people hurt you, it becomes easier to say, God, would you forgive me? Not, God, would you get them back, but God, would you forgive them? Not, God, would you strike them dead? God, would you show them the same grace that you showed me? Would you show them the same love that you showed me? Would you let them experience Jesus? Yes, I have every right to be angry. Yes, I have every right to take revenge. They're not like me. They're my enemies. But would you help me to love them in a way that Jesus loved me when I was his enemy? And as you do that, and as you fill me more with you, would you bring them and make them part of your family? See, this is why it's important, because this is how we display to the world who Jesus is. Very easy for us to love our neighbors. Very easy for us to love people that are just like us. Very easy for us to love our family. Very easy for us to love people that think like us, act like us, believe like us, or vote like us. It doesn't make a difference in the world. We're just a bunch of people who are gathering together on a Sunday morning, singing a few songs, hearing a sermon, maybe drinking a coffee afterward and leaving. That's it. But when we begin to love those who, humanly speaking, have no right to our love, when we begin to love and care for those because we have experienced the love of Jesus, it draws the attention of people. It causes eyebrows to be raised. It says, who is your God? Who is this God that you serve, that you're willing to love someone that doesn't deserve it? See, this is why this matters. So this morning, I invite you to get drawn back to the Beatitudes. If you have people in your life that you just can't stand and you have rejected them, would you be drawn back to that first Beatitude of being poor in spirit and saying, God, everything inside of me wants to hate this person. Everything inside of me wants nothing to do with this guy or this girl. That's not the way you treated me. So I'm poor, I'm broken, and there's nothing inside of me that wants to love them or be gracious to them. Will you help me? See, this matters because this is how you were treated. You did nothing good to receive God's love, kindness and love. You did nothing to say, get God's attention per se. In fact, if we're all honest in this room, I'll admit I am his worst enemy. I deserve nothing but wrath and judgment and punishment. And yet what I got is mercy and grace and forgiveness. I'm not an enemy of God anymore, but I'm a son of God. I'm no longer an orphan. I'm a child of God. I'm no longer by myself. I'm a part of his family. I got what I did not deserve. This is why this matters. Let's pray. Father, on our own, we cannot do this. We recognize and we admit that we are not able to love our enemies. But your desire for us is to be like Jesus and his standards are amazing. So, Father, we this morning ask for help. We ask that you would empower us to love the way that you loved us, to forgive those who have hurt us, to show grace and compassion to those that might not deserve it. Help us to be reminded this morning that we were in those shoes, that we did not deserve your love, we did not deserve your grace. But while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die for us. So God, I just pray that you would let our love overflow this morning. We love you.